Hey, everybody. This is Mario Dennis, your host for the Keeping It Real Estate podcast. And today I have my good friend, Rob Ratter. And first of all, yeah, how do you pronounce your last name? Rotter. Because I have this... Rotter. Always, uh, always. It's like water, but with an R is how it's pronounced. Very good, because... You know, when you see letters put together, I'm like, it's not rather. No. Don't think of it that way. Not Dan Rather. It's v- Rather. Very good. Um, for those who don't know who Rob is, um, you're probably not in Central Florida if you don't. But Rob is with Stockworth Realty, and he is probably my favorite luxury agent so. in all of Central Florida. And I, I wanted to have a conversation with you for a while. Um, but um, tell me how your day is going. It's been a busy day, actually. This has been, um, a, it's been kind of a studio day. We have a Stockworth TV studio, so we do a lot of video stuff as well. So uh, the morning started as every other Tuesday does for me. It's studio morning, so I'm in there in the studio, and uh, we're shooting videos, and then uh, then go out for appointments, and then the rest of the afternoon is kind of by appointments. Yeah, and if you're listening to this and you're curious about what Rob's talking about, um, Stockworth Realty has Stockworth TV or is it Stockworth Realty TV? They have Stockworth Studios and they run several media forms out of it. So they run uh, Winnemoon Real Estate TV. I think there's Winter Park Real Estate TV out of there as well. Stockworth TV runs out of there as well. So they, they have many avenues. Megan Morris has a channel as well and she runs that out of the Stockworth Studios. So there's several avenues that they use to get out uh, social media presence. Yeah, support. and and Rob is there very often um, with your own spot where you oftentimes will uh, talk about properties you currently have listed sure. or going on the market and that sort of thing, which it's really helpful if, if anyone is curious. You should definitely check it out and start following it. There's a ton of value on it. Thank you. And uh, the studio is beautiful. The work is done perfectly. And one of the things that I really like we were talking about um, before the podcast is Stockworth did this and there is not like, you know, bait and switch or kind of like a hidden right. uh, message on it. Like yeah. it's r- right up front and center. Stockworth sure. Realty doing this, providing value. And I really like that about it. Good. No, I appreciate it. Yeah, um, I, I don't take credit for the studio. That was actually not my idea. It was uh, Mark Hayes, who was our broker when we were at Outworth. And when we broke off, uh, Jason Schmidt became the broker at Stockworth. And uh, together those two created this. And, and Julie Bettacini and I were both... Um, uh, not really, I don't want to say sold on it, but obviously uh, for us, our job is to sell real estate. So this kind of looked like a little bit of a distraction for us. It was very difficult for us to kind of, um, I'm not speaking for her, I'm just saying for sure. me, for, for, to really kind of get involved and say, okay, this is something that I need to put some time into. Um, but yeah, we do the Rob Report. I do the Rob Report every other, every other Tuesday and that runs. And again, uh, I don't know where all they put it, but it seems to get a lot of good traction, which is nice. And yeah, I see it. I see it on the Facebook channel. Um, yeah. And and again, there's a lot of value there. And I'm, I'm glad the guys had the idea. And listen, that's probably why this partnership or sort of like the, the situation that you're in works really well, because like yourself and Julie, you guys are monsters. I mean, you guys are getting listings all the time, working with a ton of sellers, a ton of buyers. And then, you know, you have the broker involved in, you know, putting together this stu- the studio and really, you know, get, getting behind that and, and uh, making everyone buy into that value proposition. And I, I think um, it's part of the reason why that your organization runs as well as it does. So our organization is very different than pretty much, I think, any other real estate company I've ever seen. And in, in that uh, we don't compete, obviously, with our broker. Um, we, as agents, um, we are, I have a team, Julie has a team, and uh, we're, we're, we're independent. We don't... Um, work together on many projects, some things would be put together on, but uh, we run our own business separately. She does her thing, I do my thing, and then there's other agents and they do their own thing as well. But we don't compete against our broker. Our broker is there basically as a support system for us. And uh, that's one of the things I really liked about it. You walk into a a situation where uh, when I joined that company, they were only gonna take agents who were doing over 10 million a year and that was it. So you had to be income um, qualified to be uh, even considered to come in there. And their betting process actually, when we were owned by Tavistock was a lot more, uh, a lot more rigorous than I think you'd find at most real estate companies. And um, I didn't realize until I got on there how many people wanted to get into Stockworth and really could not because they were not qualified or for some reason they weren't interested in working. Yeah, in, in a world where there's um, so many companies just warehousing licenses for, sure. it, it seems almost like they have, they're trying to collect names or something. Um, right. It's very different to have a company where that's not, that's not the mantra. The mantra is, you know, there is this very um, difficult threshold to 
to get through to even be considered. That doesn't get you in the door. That gets you considered to get in the door. Right. And there's a, you know, in real estate, like any other business, there are so many different ways to run a business. And there are many different business models. I mean, we came from a a, a company that was uh, a real estate and training company, or excuse me, coaching and training company, not a real estate company. They didn't sell homes. They basically helped agents to get to that level. And it was a great training ground for me. But I got to the point that I was yinging and everyone else was yanging. I mean, I didn't count how many homes I sold as units. I counted them as homes. And it was a very difficult um, uh, situation for me to try to balance selling a home versus selling the units because I could sell a $4 million home and you know that counted as one unit where somebody was selling 30 condos, that counted as 30 units and they're beating me in terms of what the production level for the, what the office was monitoring uh, or, or tracking. So you know, I always say that units didn't pay my mortgage and um, that's really why the dollars made more sense. When you're selling luxury, you're selling a totally different type of product. Yeah, and, you know, I've talked about in the podcast before, <clears throat> but it's worth mentioning. I, I should keep a running sheet of meaningless stats that right. real estate ag- agents yeah. like to um, keep. And so units is one of those meaningless stats. Yeah. It's only meaningful if it's zero. If it's zero, then it has, it has some real meaning behind it. But well, yeah. aside from that, you know, units, like you said, you know, you don't go to Publix with units. No. And, you know, a lot of new agents when they get into business, their first question is, you know, I want to go to a brokerage where that offers me 100% commission where I keep the most. And obviously the response is, well, what is, if you're selling nothing, what's 100% of nothing? It's still nothing. So you need to pick a company that actually will train you and get you going so that later down the road, you can worry about what your commission split is. Yeah. And, and again, part of the thing that I really like about the way Stockworth is doing it is there's a lot of brokers that will say that they're taking um, a support role and they're non-competing. Right. But there is also a lot of brokers that say that that are in the Bahamas right now sipping on a Mai Tai. Right. Um, <laughs> so that be nice. <laughs> so, um, so, th- you know, when, um, I forget your broker's name. Mark Mark yeah, well, Mark. When, now, yeah, yeah. yeah, when Mark um, says he's, you know, is in a support role, he's building a ginormous, ginormous studio. He's putting together this gigantic operation sure. for social media and media in general. And so, you know, that that's some genuine value there. I really appreciate that. Um, but yeah, so you're the luxury guy. And that's really why I wanted to talk to you. Because... <laughs> There's not that many of you out there, but it seems every agent wants to be like you. Have you noticed that? Uh, yeah. I mean, everyone wants to, they see, they see million dollar listing on TV and they think, oh, it's easy. Everyone should do it. Um, you know, we, we, we know we get the same license from the state. The, the license doesn't specify whether you can sell a $5 million condo or a 50, or excuse me, a $5 million home or a $50,000 condo. It just says you're licensed to sell isn't real it, estate. Isn't that a little crazy? It is. I've crazy. never thought of it in those terms, but yeah. it seems a little, a little crazy that it's the same license to sell yeah. a fifty thousand dollar condo or a ten million dollar house, and we believe, I believe, especially, is that uh, when we're in luxury, we're selling a lifestyle. We're not selling a home. You're not just selling a three bedroom, two bath home in a neighborhood. Which is there's nothing wrong with that. That's great. You know, just as we talked about different business models that brokerages have, so do different agents. A different agent specializes in different things. And if you're a luxury agent, you're really selling a lifestyle. You're not just selling a house. Most people do not need an eight million dollar home on lake that's twenty thousand square feet. That's not really a need most people have. So we're selling the lifestyle that goes along with that. What comes along with that? The cars, the boat, the country clubs, the private schools. Those relationships are what we have, and that's what we sell, and that's what we bring to the table. So somebody's moving in this area, that's what they're expecting. You know, I don't usually consider my competition another agent generally. Um, I don't consider, you know, a, pick, a, pick a brokerage, a, a Keller Williams, a Central 21, or a Cobalt Banker agent. You know, they're not generally my competition. My competition is really going to be, or, or the standard that my client expects is basically what they're getting from their private shopper at Neiman Marcus. So that's the level of service that we are expected to provide to our clients. And that's, that's a giant contrast between sure. what you're doing versus, you know, say I'm showing a buyer home, a home that just went on the market and there's three offers on it. Like there's not Neiman Marcus treatment. It's a, it's a very, you know, it's a come to Jesus time, if you will, of saying, hey, there's three offers on this house. If you sleep on it, you won't sleep in it. Let's write an offer on it if you want it. You know, that's that's very different than, than sure. what you're doing because what you're doing oftentimes, I pursue when you're selling a lifestyle, it doesn't take an hour to do one showing and you go write an offer. No, I mean, and, and it's a relationship. So, uh, you know, we work with a lot of athletes. So a lot of the athletes come here. They're not real estate savvy. They're hiring basically somebody who is 
going to bring them the whole lifestyle. They want to move into a home that has a car in the garage. The house is already furnished. They want to make sure the kids uh, are in the public, excuse me, in the private schools. They want to have those relationships done for them and set up for them. And that's really what we're selling. We're selling the whole lifestyle. So what's the country club like? You know, in the areas that we live in and sell in, if you're not a member of a club, then how can you sell that lifestyle if you don't know that lifestyle? Right. So I think that's a big distinction. I mean, people think that just because they got a real estate license and they know how to get to a certain neighborhood that they should sell in there. And that's not fair to the client because you're not selling the whole package. You're just selling the bricks and mortar. Yeah. I mean, and I've often said, you know, we're talking a little bit about the more glamorous side of selling luxury real estate, but there is also, a, I don't want to use the word ugly, sure. but I can't think of a better one right now. <laughs> well, that's the reality. I mean, the reality is it's not always like you see on million dollar listing. You know, you take a listing and sometimes these sellers are not motivated and they're not, um, they're not motivated and they're not under the same time restraints that most sellers would be under. So, you know, let's say you list a $500,000 home and it's expected to sell in four to six months. Well, uh, you talk about a $5 million home, it could sit on the market in our inventory. The $5 million market could be a five, five year commitment. So is your seller really interested in being in it for five years? Are you interested in being in it for five years? What if you bring them an offer? It's a great offer and they don't want it. There's not a comp you can show, oh, here, Mr. Seller, this is what you should take because there's one down the street that just sold. Well, that doesn't exist in this market. So are we on the same page moving forward and throughout the price uh, in price cycle of the listing? You know, are you competitive? Are you priced where you should be? I mean, some sellers obviously um, have their own um, idea what the house is worth. They don't care what a competition is because they don't feel like there's competition. Their home is unlike any other home out there. So it's being able to show them this is what the market is telling you your house is worth. Are you interested in selling it? And some sellers, especially in the high end, will say, no, I'm not interested in selling it. So now you've spent two or three years on a listing that's not going to sell. And it's two or three years and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. Sure. Absolutely. Easily. Easily yeah. thousands of dollars. Yeah, that's one of the things that I, you know, whenever people start talking about luxury real estate, I always, you know, I've had a lot more experience on the buyer side than on the seller side. And I really like working on the on the buyer side with it. On the seller side, I understand that's more specialized. And um, part of the thing that I feel like a lot of agents sometimes don't understand is that financial commitment. That if you have, you know, if you have four or five, six listings out there that are $2 million or, or, or above in our market, you're probably easily five figures deep in marketing, pictures. Yeah, I mean, it's and it's a process. Obviously, you've got to start off the gate with uh, professional photography is a given, generally video is a given. You've got to have the platforms to get those listings out. Uh, MLS is different because when you list a property such as that, you know, yeah, obviously it goes in realtor.com and MLS and everything else, but a lot of those buyers are not looking on the internet to find a home. A lot of those buyers are actually not even in the market. They don't know they're in the market. So we have to figure out a way to go get them, say, hey, look at this house. And they say, oh, that's a great house. I want to buy it. So it's not only just putting a house out there. It's actually going to find those buyers. And again, that goes back to the relationships. What kind of relationships are you in? I mean, if you're, if you're somebody who's at a country club and you're sing, uh, socializing with the people who would be typical clients for this property, you know, are you talking about real estate to them? Are you figuring out what their lifestyle is? Are they talking about things that would may trigger a question about, are they interested in, in, in maybe moving up or moving down in the market? So it's relationships with buyers, sellers. The whole, the whole process is about relationships. It's interesting because we always associate the um, luxury market with a more sophisticated buyer in their way of thinking. But I don't think most people make the connection that a sophisticated buyer means an absentee buyer, meaning he's not necessarily looking for a home is what you're saying. You have to go and look for them. You have to go and sure. bring it to them. Well, we um, think as agents, we think if we list a property, everyone in the world knows it's there. A lot of times that's not the case. You know, a lot of these high end homes will hit the market and we've got to figure out who those buyers likely are, who are not even in the market, who don't even know they want a new house. And you go out and you find them and you say, Hey, you know, what's your situation? Are you interested or hated? Do you know anybody who's interested in, in, in buying this particular house? And they say, well, maybe I am. You know, I hadn't thought about it, but what? tell me more about the house. So if you're in relationships with those kind of people and you have those relationships with buyers who are qualified and able to make those kind of purchases, that's where you find success. How does, how did you get involved in luxury real estate? So I was, my background is television news. I came here in Orlando from Las Vegas uh, 
gosh, 1997. And I was supposed to be here for one year, a California boy, and uh, <laughs> never thought I would end up on the East Coast. And uh, I, I came with the CBS affiliate and worked there for a while and uh, uh, ended up getting married. My wife's an attorney, and uh, we lived in Windermere. And thankfully, we ran in the crowd that we knew. And uh, back to the relationships. We were happened to be in the relationship with the right people. So um, one of my first listings was a $1.25 million home. And the reason I knew that, or the reason I got that was because I knew the people. And those were the relationships I was in. A lot of times people come in and say, you know, uh, they want to get into luxury real estate. And I say, great, well, tell me about your lifestyle. Well, you know, I just graduated from college and I'm in a condo downtown. I'm like, that's great. You're going to sell condos downtown probably. You know, tell me what country club you belong to. Oh, I don't play in a club. I can't afford it. Tell me what kind of car you drive. You know, all those things that we as new agents feel like um, we need to have to get to that level. Um, it, it really is true, I think, in the luxury market because those buyers and sellers expect that from you. Absolutely. So um, just to answer your question, so I got into real estate. My wife's an attorney, and we talked about um, my other passion. I, I, I felt like I needed to make a change out of television news and um, got my real estate license, and it was 15 years, 16 years ago now. Yeah, that's, you know, one of the things that I like about your story is that we have this mentality in real estate, with I, which I think has certainly a, a positive thing connotation to it but it can also be taken too far which is sort of this you got a hustle mentality you know and and with you what i like is you necessarily didn't have to hustle you had a career in television your wife is an attorney evidently you guys were making a good living you know before real estate mm -hmm. and when you got that 1.2 million dollar listing you probably could be getting you know, half a dozen of those transactions a year without leaving your house or trying at all. And, and you didn't. You decided to become an expert and provide a higher level of service and seek more customers and grow a business, you know, that you really didn't have to grow. Well, I don't know if that's totally true. I mean, I think that you're still, just because you're in that circle and you're running with those people doesn't mean people automatically become listed to you. You have to develop a relationship. And I think it's especially true more in the higher end is you get clients who have, um, they, they, they know of realtors all over the place. And, and, and you know, everyone knows, you know. The especially joke. in Windermere. Yeah, yeah. the joke <laughs> is you can't swing a dead cat and not hit a realtor in this town. And it's true. Um, there are so many realtors everywhere. And everyone has a realtor. Everyone has an aunt who's a realtor. And uh, it, it I think the big distinction is you have to be in relationships with people who learn to trust you and to, to, to believe uh, for them to believe that they trust you and that you're not just out to, to make a quick buck. You know, um, when I'm with my friends that are not um, uh, in, in the real estate business, you know, they ask me questions about real estate. I don't generally bring it up. I generally am not the one that starts talking about real estate because I don't want to be that guy. I think that's cheesy and that's not appropriate. Your circle of friends will get smaller if you become that guy. Right, right. And I mean, you don't have to be that guy. People come to you. They should come to you because they trust you. They know you and they know your track record. It doesn't just happen. I mean, that's not exactly how it started. Obviously, it's years and years of doing this. Of course. But there's no easy way, in my opinion, to do this, especially no easy way to do luxury because there's such a high level of trust. And honestly, if you're new in the business, you shouldn't be doing luxury because if you screw up it's a small world and everyone's going to know about it yeah and the thing about luxury um i think the thing that really separates a lot of luxury agencies understanding the luxury is a funnel you have all the agents at the top but there's so many that are trying to get through that funnel so sure. so the competition is fierce to get through it so when you really kind of make a name for yourself as a luxury agent that means you've probably gone through some serious trial and tribula tribulations to get to that point and you got to you got to know your shit. I mean, well, and I've got friends that are selling three hundred thousand dollars homes, and they're making more money than I am sure. because they're doing volume units, as we said before, um, and that's a totally different aspect. But to me, I get more nervous selling a two hundred thousand dollars house sometimes than I do a, a four million dollars house. It's just a different mindset. It's what I'm used to. So you know, it's not just that you know the luxury agents make more money. It's not always the case. Some they, some obviously they do, right? But it's not always about the money. It's about what you know. And you have to be honest with yourself. You have to say to yourself, okay, what world am I in? You know, what country club am I belong to? Who are my five closest friends and what do they do? Right. Um, one thing that, another message that I think a lot of real estate agents can take from the luxury, like sort of like, there's a lot of stuff that doesn't relate from, you know, normal residential market to the luxury market. Yep. But there's one thing that I think translates really well, which is what you said about, when you're around with friends, you are not the guy talking about real estate or bringing it up. You're not being that guy. 
And oftentimes, real estate agents feel and are trained that they need to be that guy. And I don't think that's the case. I think that's something that it's effective across, you know, across all walks of life that, you know, if you're the guy that's always talking about real estate, people are not going to invite you to parties are often as often. Right. Um, well, I don't wear a name badge. Never have. Um, and I don't have a business. Card well, you're a celebrity. So there's that. <laughs> <Stop it. laughs> and I don't have a business card in my right hand uh, or left hand, you know, depending on left or right. The um, uh, you go to a lot of these networking functions and people just all they're doing is walking up to you talking real estate. They're bringing it up and it's all they're doing. And you're like, OK, back off. Like, I need to know who I'm doing business with first and know what kind of person you are before I realize whether or not you'd be somebody I'd want to work with on my largest, hopefully largest purchase. Yeah, it's interesting because, so I'm, I shy away from a lot of the networking events um, because I'm more of an introvert than I am an extrovert. So, so I don't really, believe it or not. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I don't really need to be out there doing that all the time. Um, but I've had so much success at not being the guy with the business card on my hand. So much, like I literally, I had a closing this morning. An agent from Tampa referred me to this person. We met at a networking event mm-hmm. and we just struck a conversation, started talking. And by the next day, she referred me her sister and she referred me her sister because she was like, you just seem like you know your stuff and you seem like a good guy. And I felt like you would be a good match with my sister. And you didn't talk about real estate for one second. Right. And I was like, well, that's, yeah, it works. Yeah. It works. Now, I'm happy when people bring it up because I'll talk about real estate all day long. Yeah. But I'm not the one generally um, to bring it up. On the tennis court with friends and playing tennis, I'm not generally talking about real estate. But it's surprising to me how many people bring it up. Well, of course, because what you've done, you've allowed the circle of people to run around you to talk to you about real estate freely because they know you enjoy it. And so they will approach at any time. They'll they'll be like, "Hey, Rob, do you see the house that went on the market? Hey, right. can I take a look at it?" Because sure. they know they know mm-hmm. you really love what you do. They know that you are into it. But you don't need to be talking about it twenty four seven for them to know that. You know, so there's a there's a line in there for sure. Well, that's a good lesson, I think. I think people need to learn that. I think people need to know, especially in the business. You know, we're told to go out and talk to everybody about real estate. Well, and that's great, especially when you're new. But when you're more established, that's not exactly the way, at least we do it in the high-end market. I, I think that's just one of those blanket pieces of advice that are given to new agents, primarily because they don't have anything else to say to new agents of value. So, you know, you know, one of the things that I really enjoy is thinking about things on a critical level. And, you know, I think a lot of times what happens with the real estate training is two things. There are some things that get repeated for the last 50 years and mm-hmm. it continues to be repeated and no one sits down and says, hey, hold on, let's think about this today as 2019 and see how that applies to today. Right. People don't do that. People just keep regurgitating the same all lines from Glen Gary, Glen Ross, you know, sure. 30 years later. And then... Um, the other thing that happens is the people that are coming up with this catchphrase or lines or training have been out of the sales force for 10 years, 15 years. You know, it always cracks me up when there's a trainer that I know hasn't sold a house in 10 years right. trying to teach me how to convert an online lead. And I'm like, really? What, well, what, what sort of experience did you have in that? They say that's the best way to make money in real estate is actually to sell something to somebody who's in real estate. Well, it's, you know, I actually... I used to have, I got to dig this stuff up. I used to have a little graph that I did at one point, yeah. which I explain why there's so much success in sort of the coaching and training. Right. Because when real estate agents are doing really well, they have a lot of extra money to spend. So they'll sign up to things just to sign up to them because, yeah. because they have the money for it. And when the market crashes, then they get desperate and they'll sign up for things and mortgage their house if they need to. And they'll continue to sign up for the same things because now they're in a desperate situation. They're looking for a silver bullet. So that's why the coaching and training industry in real estate, I think, has a much more stable lifespan than the real estate industry itself. Oh, sure. I mean, again, make money selling to realtors because when the market goes down, you're selling a dream. Just like some realtors who don't know what they're doing. They're trying to sell a dream to a client. And the client sees right through it, and hopefully the realtor does too. Um, you have a, a team. Yes. Can you tell me a little bit about your team structure? So I'm an admin who um, does office work, and uh, she helps at broker opens and open houses. Um, she is licensed, but I don't really um, have the time usually to stay at a broker open. It's not really the best use of time. I try to be there when I can, but she handles that for me, which is great. And then I've got uh, two other agents that handle typically buyer agents or listing agent or, or listing appointments as well. So um, there's really, and that's just the team at the office and then obviously you've got the social media manager and all the rest of the stuff that 
the brokerage has as support staff for the for the for us. So you are out there showing homes and listing homes. Yes. You're not a team leader that's sitting in your couch flipping the TV and. I wish no. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I, I don't uh, think you wish that. No, no, no. I would never do. That. I work. I, I literally am a seven day a week kind of guy, which um, I think is probably not the dream most people have in real estate. I think they figure it depends. Do you enjoy it? I love it. Absolutely. Then that's you're living I, your dream. I do. I absolutely. I, I I went on vacation uh, this summer for a week. Uh, went back to California for a while and uh, uh, had a great time with the family. And that was very. Um, unlike me to do that, which is nice. Uh, we have a place in Miami and we hardly ever go. And, um, my wife would love to go more often. And, um, I, 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 I'm getting to the point that I'm better at going away, which is kind of what the goal is eventually. Uh, but no, I'm very hands-on. I love, I love what I do. I love uh, the business. I love being at work. I love being out with people. Yeah. And that's, I think that's the main reason why you are sitting here today, because that's one thing that I notice about you. And I gravitate towards people that enjoy real estate. I don't really gravitate towards people that use real estate as a vehicle to get out of real estate. No, I mean, I, I think it is true. I, you know, we, I think the numbers are something like 83% of people who get their real estate license are not in the business 18 months after they get their license. So it really does sh show um, the people who are really selling real estate and have been doing it for more than two or three years are the ones that love it and will keep doing it. And I think that's very important. I think as a consumer, you should know how long your agent's been in the business. Do they know their numbers? Because if they don't know their numbers, they're certainly not going to know your numbers and what your house is worth. Yeah, and I think with part of that thought is also that people should know that their agent, you're going to basically pay the same no matter how you who you use. So sure. might as well use the guy that really takes pride on his work and loves what he does. Because I don't know that, I, I, I always say this, like I love real estate so much, like, I may taper down to spend more time with my family and I have since right. I had my daughter and you know, you make some adjustments, but God, I can't see the day that I'm not selling a house. Like I can't see the day where I spend, you know, a whole week without going into a house. It's just something that I, it's a good thing that I get paid for it because I would probably do it even right. if I didn't get paid for well, it. Well, look, and there's good and there's bad. I mean, obviously um, I've got four kids, so I love to spend time with my kids and my wife. It's the most fun thing I can do. Um, so, you know, uh, today I may be done at three or in three in the afternoon. So I'll be home when they get home from school and then we'll have a little bit of afternoon. So when I say I work seven days a week, I'm not working all day long. Sure. Saturday morning, I, you know, I was out with the kids, I played tennis for a while, did a little bit of stuff with them. We ran errands and then I started working at two in the afternoon and worked until about seven or eight. So, you know, it's just a different way of living your life, but you're still making priorities and st your family is still a priority, at least for me. It's, it's priority. Yeah. Yeah. You're just managing your time in a way that makes you. Um, productive, but it also keeps you close to your family and doing the things that you enjoy with them. Yeah, and anybody who gets in the real estate business because they feel like they want to quote unquote control their own life, ah. hear it right now. That is not at all what happens when you get in real estate. You actually just sign your life away and say, if you're really going to do this and really do it successful. Now, again, you can do it and sell three homes a year. That's fine. Do whatever you want. That's absolutely acceptable. Um, I'd rather you refer a real business to somebody who's doing it full time. That's a better service to your client and really to yourself. Collect referral fees. Um, that's a whole other discussion, but anyway, so I, it, um, in fact, I posted this last week. I think it came out of the Keller Williams mega camp last week. Jay, Jay Papasan has made a comment from on the stage. From what I'm told, he said 90% of realtors do not list more than five homes. 95. A year. I think, 95 it, was, I think do, it was like 95%. Do not list more than five homes a year. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and as yeah. I put it in my post on Facebook, imagine if you found out your doctor did five surgeries a year, that's it. Would you go to that doctor anymore? No way. Yeah, it's, you know, so a lot of that stuff is, it's really, really troubling. And, you know, to your point about the flexibility of schedule, I, yeah. I used to, um, I used to teach a class on my previous brokerage to new agents that was about buyers or whatnot. And um, at one point I had a class, I think it was like 16 or 18 people on it. And, you know, I'm like, okay, let's get to know each other a little bit. We're going to spend six hours together for two days. So let's get to know each other a little bit. I'm like, um, you know, what did you get into the real estate industry? And everybody's like, oh, the flexibility of schedule, the flexibility of schedule. You know, everybody says that. Yeah. And I'm like, well, I have bad news for you. So let's start on the right foot. <laughs> Better hear it now than later. When, right? they, <laughs> when they told you uh, real estate, it's an industry that affords flexibility of schedule. The problem is they didn't finish the phrase or you didn't listen all the way through. It affords flexibility of schedule to the consumer, meaning the consumer yes. can dictate your schedule at any time. Yeah. You have to have a flexible schedule because... 
you need to be able to flex to accommodate the consumer's hours. That's right. And you see everybody like this, and I'm like, so yeah. if you're getting brand new to real estate for the next 12 months, kiss your life goodbye. Yeah. Go home, kiss your wife, and said, hey, or your husband, or your significant other, or your kids, and be like, I'm not going to be the best for the next 12 months, but I promise you it's it's worth it for our family going forward. And and I've caught a lot of flack for that because people are like, no, there's a way to leverage. And listen, I'm you sure can. there is. You can. You can do whatever you want. You can sell three homes a year. That's it. Yeah. But that's not how. If you're going to do this and it's be a, a repetition. professional real estate agent and you're going to serve your clients like a real professional does, this is not just a full-time job. This is your full-time life. Right. It's the 10,000 hour principle that it takes 10,000 hours to master a skill. You know, there was a book that, yeah. that, that was about that. And I always equate it to real estate. And I say, maybe it's not 10,000 hours. Maybe it's 50 transactions. Well, get them off your back as soon as possible. Yep. You know, you have to try to get that done as soon as possible. If you're only doing it a little bit here and a little bit there, it's going to take you forever to go through the, me the the number of repetitions that you need to go through to be proficient yeah. with a contract or be proficient with a listing agreement or be proficient in showings or, you know, the, the, the silliest of things that, that, that we, you know, we take for granted at this point. Even opening, opening lock boxes, you know, like the, the easiest of thing. It just takes a lot of repetition to become really good at it. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I um, uh, Julie Bettacini, um, that woman is a machine. She works all the time. She works like a machine. She is always on spot. And I mean, her numbers show it. And that's, there's no easy way around it. There's no fast ticket to selling homes, especially big ones. Yeah, no, absolutely not. Because also there's a, a an additional time demand with luxury real estate. And it's that oh, yeah. um, if you have a listing, more often than not, the listing agent has to be there for the showings. Oh, yes. Now, if you have... Haven't even gone there, yes. But no, you're right. I mean, that's... Now, if you have 15 listings... <laughs> I've got almost... I don't know. Yeah, 15? Yeah. So now, if you have 15 listings and 14 or 12 require the listing agent to be there, like, yeah. it's a really slippery slope, yeah. you know, between, you know, yeah, between trying to keep a hold of your life and being a successful luxury agent and having no life at all. So, you know, it, it's really demanding. Really yeah, I mean, I don't really make plans for the weekends because I know that um, I'll be showing property somewhere along the way. If not to a buyer, then one of the listings will generally list uh, a show. Um, I've had up to 30, I think 35 was my max number of listings. And they, you're working every day because you're showing it. Or someone from your team has to be there to show it. Right. And it is, it, yeah, it's, but I mean, that's what we're, that's what we signed up for. If you don't want to do it, then don't do it. Pass right. the listings on. Yeah, but I think, you know, the important thing about talking about it is that we are talking about it. But, sure. but, I don't know that anyone else is talking about it. I don't know that the average agent understands the time commitment, the financial commitment associated with being a luxury agent as a, um, as a career goal. Like if you decide to be, you know, a, a luxury agent and you decide that that's what you're going to dabble, people don't know the hardships. People just see what they see in TV, you yeah. know, yeah. big homes, big commission checks, celebrities, blah, blah, blah. They don't understand all the minutia in between that. That's very time consuming. There's a full other side of it. <laughs> um, as far as luxury uh, real estate in Central Florida, we know Windermere is kind of the hotbed for it and has been for a while, Winter Park. Yep. Is there some other up and coming areas for luxury real estate that, that, that have come up over the last few years? Well, Lake Nona, I think Lake is Nona. probably the biggest given. Uh, Lake Nona and obviously the West Orange County, the Hamlin area, these are the two biggest growth areas. And you've got luxury pockets in both of those areas. Obviously, Lake Nona, the Country Club, uh, they're, they're expanding. They're getting bigger. Uh, country Club out there is uh, rocking it. It's a great community. I mean, it's my second favorite community in, in Central Florida. And uh, I think for good reason. There's a lot of growth potential. As USTA grows over there, you know, 300 relocations that came into that area. Uh, Orlando City Soccer um, training facility down there and all the other uh, sports cluster businesses that are coming. Lake Nona is rocking it. And uh, I think that's going to be, um, if you're interested in, in growth and looking at uh, what, new areas, Lake Nona is number one for me. Yeah, if, if you want to get in Windermere 25 years ago. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Going to Lake Nona today. Well, and Tavistock's role out there has been amazing. And uh, they did it from the ground up and they've, mm -hmm. did, they've done it the right way. And um, I think the success out there is unduplicated. And uh, it's, it's, it's truly an amazing place. If you go out there, make sure you stop at Boxy Park and get the uh, lobster rolls. They're amazing. <laughs> Very cool. I'm definitely going to do that. I, I love to eat. Yeah. I think most people love to eat, but I really love to eat. Rob, thank you so much for sure. coming in. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. 
Um, if someone is listening to this and wants to hear more about you or get in touch with you, what's the best way to find you? So Rob at Stockworth.com is the easiest way. Rob at Stockworth.com. Also, um, um, Stockworth.com real estate and um, uh, the web, find, web page, you'll find me through there. Find me through there. All right. Thank you, Rob. Thanks. Thanks.